So the idea that certain institutions of the medieval period lend themselves in genesis or evolution from the days of the Roman Empire is not a new one. Perhaps the most apparent case of this is with the development of monasticism, with the first monks being hermits living in the caves of Roman Egypt, and the now famous rule of Saint Benedict building off of and revising what was already at the time centuries of monastic tradition. Perhaps an even better example of this is the Catholic Church itself, which continued the use of the Latin language over a thousand years after the conventional fall of the empire in the West. However, as soon as other glaringly medieval institutions are argued to have a distinctly Roman origin, things can get controversial. Of course what I'm talking about is serfdom and manorialism. Both the end of the classical slave economy in Roman society and the rise of the serf class, as well as the beginning of the usage of the manor system, can be contentious to give a date on when the changes occurred. These answers range from the reign of Emperor Diocletian to the Carolingian Empire, or even as late as the 11th century. Regardless, I'll do my best to try to make the case for at least some involvement in late antiquity for the development of these vital institutions. But in order to do so, we must first establish what serfdom and manorialism even are. We can first start with serfdom. The Oxford Dictionary defines a serf as an unfree medieval peasant under the control of the lord whose land he worked. So in other words, serfdom describes the relationship between a serf and his lord, specifically the obligations to which they had to each other. The serf would take care of the lord's land and offer services to the lord, and in return the lord would provide certain benefits to the serf, such as protection. However, this quote-unquote agreement was prone to abuse. For example, another key feature of being a serf was that they were legally not allowed to leave the lord's land, and were in most cases tied to the land. The status of being a serf was also inherited to children. There were variations of serfdom depending on the location and time period. For example, serfs in the early modern Russian Empire could be bought and sold like chattel slaves. But we will focus on serfdom in specifically medieval Western Europe where serfs were tied to their land and thus ownership of them was only transacted along the buying and selling of the land itself. In short, being a serf in high medieval society was a social rank placing the individual legally below and in obligation and service to their lord, aka the property holder of the land that they inhabited. Serfdom has been at times described as a fairly unique uh, institution to medieval European society, and even though it cannot be denied that this was certainly the height of the institution, it can however still be argued that some important aspects of serfdom as a concept have their origin within the Roman Empire itself. But first, some background to understand what Rome was like before the changes occurred. If you know some basic Roman history, I encourage you to listen along anyway, because once we get to the meat of the video, things can get really complicated really fast. And I want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Alright. This may not be surprising to hear to anyone who knows something about Roman society, which was very much a slave-driven economy, and this was primarily fueled by constant war and conquest. In 167 BC, 150,000 slaves entered the slave market from Epirus. At the end of the Punic Wars, in 146 BC, a further 50,000 slaves were captured from the destruction of Carthage. And most of all, Julius Caesar's conquests of Gaul produced 400,000 slaves by 50 BC. This wasn't the greatest extent of slavery in Rome, and it doesn't account for the slaves captured in more minor conflicts or slaves for monetary debts, but it does show how willing Romans, and particularly the Roman elite, were to absorb massive amounts of slaves at a time. In other words, there definitely was demand, and that demand was supplied. Interestingly enough, both the demand and supply of slaves could have been both caused by the same wars in the late Republic as not only did those wars increase the supply of slaves, but as Roman freemen were being conscripted to fight in these wars, free labor became rarer and more expensive, so alternative labor was more desired. Regardless, by the end of the Republic, slavery had become an irrefutably vital part of the Roman economy. However, some scholars in the past argued that sometime in the dominant period of the Roman Empire, perhaps beginning in the 4th century, the Roman landed aristocracy began to transition from primarily using slaves to serfs. 
This sort of transition is somewhat supported by the appearance of certain laws introduced by Emperor Diocletian and especially Emperor Constantine. It is in these legal documents that we see the introduction of a class or rank of people known as coloni, singular colonus. These laws can be found in the Codex Theosanus, a document outlining all the laws proclaimed by Christian emperors up until the reign of Theodosius II. The 1952 English translation by Clyde Farr, for example, includes the excerpt under Title 17, De Fugitivis Colonis Inquilinus et Servis, translated to Fugitive Coloni, Inquilini, and Slaves. First notice how Servis, singular Servus, is translated to slave, yet Coloni is kept in its Latin form. In late Roman society, a Colonus wasn't exactly a slave, a Servus, but also wasn't exactly a free man. Here Constantine states that the punishment of a colonus is to be reduced to a servus, so clearly the Romans thought that it was different enough. Yet a colonus also certainly wasn't free, not being able to leave their masters. So given that coloni weren't exactly allowed to leave their land, yet they were considered distinct from slaves, then they must be serfs. This didn't happen overnight, but rather with a series of legal changes over multiple emperors. But first, it's important to understand in what ways the Roman world changed up until this point. Before Diocletian took the throne, Rome was ruled by a series of emperors from 235 AD to 284 AD, called by historians as Barrax Emperors. They were characterized by their incredibly short rules, sometimes lasting less than a single year, altogether having 26 different emperors. As the name suggests, these emperors came from the barracks, being military commanders constantly usurping the throne and claiming themselves to be the rightful emperor. This entire period, known as the Crisis of the 3rd century, among other things, made glaringly obvious one issue the Roman Empire uniquely had. There were, in fact, absolutely no qualifications to be an emperor. Practically speaking, all you needed to be was to be popular. And this is exactly what the barracks emperors were to the few loyal legions that they commanded. This would be enough to claim the title and initiate a civil war, possibly even concluding with an outright victory. So when Diocletian became the sole ruler of the empire in 284, he had to break the cycle of constantly rising challengers. His solution to this was expanding the imperial bureaucracy so that the government could effectively address the wide-ranging problems the empire faced at more places at once. The first step in expanding the bureaucracy and preventing the rise of usurpers was ironically for Diocletian to share his power as emperor. In 285, after only a year of sole rule, he appointed a non-relative soldier named Maximium to become co-emperor in the western half of the empire whilst Diocletian managed the eastern portion as well as the ongoing conflict Rome was fighting with Persia. Soon after, two more junior emperors were appointed, giving a total of a college of four emperors, an arrangement now known to historians as the Tetrarchy, Rule of Four. Altogether, there were four different co-emperors traveling across their portions of the empire, solving various problems all whilst, theoretically, acting in constant unison with one another. The second change the Euclidean made, and the one much more important to the topic of serfdom right now, was the general expansion of the imperial bureaucracy in the provinces. In the past, the emperor's rule was helped and sometimes hindered by the Praetorian prefect, the leader of the Praetorian Guard, but also the figure who gradually grew in influence and responsibility. Eventually, by the time of Diocletian, the role of the Praetorian prefect resembled that of a grand vizier, not only leading the Praetorian Guard, but also, as Hugh Elton puts it, recruiting the troops and providing supplies to the army and imperial staff, as well as acting as judges, taking care of public works, roads, and the cursus publicus, the empire-wide courier and transportation service, and often acting as generals. And in the words of Kanye West, no one man should have all that power. Having one man with so much power was certainly a security risk, as the Praetorian Guard would be responsible for many coups and assassinations. And in fact, a total of eight different emperors were assassinated by the Praetorian Guard. But even if the Praetorian Prefect had good intentions, this was still an undoubtedly huge amount of responsibilities for one man to have, putting a strain on how much the Imperial Bureaucracy could perform and accomplish at any given moment. So in addition to sharing power with three other co-emperors, Diocletian also expanded the number of Imperial positions in general. 
drastically reducing the Praetorian Prefect's responsibilities. For instance, he greatly expanded the power of local governments, firstly by dividing the empire from just 50 provinces to almost 100. Italy itself was split into 8 different provinces, increasing the number of provinces meant increasing the number of provincial governors, and reducing the scale of each governor's responsibility, allowing for them to focus more closely to the unique problems of their local communities. He also created many new positions which were subject directly to him, not through the Praetorian Prefect. Altogether, the Tetrarchy and the new imperial bureaucracy dramatically expanded the capabilities of the government, not just to act on the local level, but also to more efficiently collect resources from the lands. Of course, what I'm referring to is tax collection. With this newly hired army of bureaucrats, Diocletian sent them to every village in the empire to survey their size, population, and quality of land to determine the Capitatio Iugatio tax collection system. Under this new system, the Iugia or land and Capita or people were counted as the same in determining how much tax the agricultural state owned the government. This tax reform dramatically improved the revenues of the imperial government, especially since for the first time ever it applied to Italy itself. Yet it was also seen as complicated with how these two seemingly different quantities, land and people, were being treated interchangeably by tax calculations. This system would survive throughout the reign of Diocletian and his immediate successors. Needless to say, it wasn't all that popular, and we have some sources of complaints from the era. Perhaps the most dramatic telling was from the Christian Punic author Lactantius, an advisor in the court of Emperor Constantine and famous theologian. In one of his works, Der Mortibus Persecutorum, or On the Manner of Which Persecutors Died, he writes about the history of Christian persecution up until the legalization of Christianity under Emperor Constantine. He also takes the time to highlight the injustices of the Tetrarchy's oppressive tax reforms. It is of course important to remember that under the Tetrarchy was also a dramatic height of Christian persecution, so like Tatius, being a Christian himself could just be trying to make the Tetrarchy's rule sound all around more evil. However, we don't need to guess that the tax reform was probably very unpopular, especially in Italy itself, as before Diocletian, Italy enjoyed hundreds of years of tax exemption. Under Diocletian and the Capitatio Iugatio, that would no longer be the case. It's probably also worth noting that Lactantius' own emperor, Constantine himself, did have his own tax reforms. Constantine probably saw the massive bureaucratic expansion under the Tetrarchy as too radical in many ways, and he wished to streamline some of the convoluted complexities that contemporaries like Lactantius criticized. He did so by cutting many taxes and replacing the revenue with an empire-wide tax on quote-unquote traders in the widest sense, which was basically just a general sales tax. Yet perhaps the most impactful change for the long-term development of socio-economic relations in Rome was his reform on the Capitatio Iugatio. Remember how in the Capitatio Iugatio, the way taxes were calculated for an estate, the land and the people on the land were counted as the same? Well, as you might have expected, the system was extremely confusing, as especially since land could be sold or bought and people can move away or in. Constantine understood this problem and declared in law a fix. He decreed that the coloni would be tied to the estate and not allowed to leave the land. This way, the Capitatio Iugatio tax wouldn't have dr drastically varying calculations from year to year, and some consistency in the system would preside. So then, it's clear that these coloni bear a distinctly important resemblance to the later serfs of medieval times, being tied to the land. It started with Diocletian's expansive bureaucratic and tax reforms, and crystallized of the legal framework under Constantine. From there, the class was fully born. This still doesn't fully answer the question though. Where did the coloni come from exactly? Who were these people being counted on the estates of these tax calculations? Why did this happen to them? To answer this question, we have to make an important distinction. Coloni were not tenant farmers. This is where it starts to get interesting. Remember back to the Codex Theodosanius, where we saw the mention of coloni as well as servi, which we established to be slaves. The third group there is inquilini. Those were the tenant farmers. So then the relationship between colonus and a state holder are more complicated than just a tenant paying rent to his landlord. To fully understand this complexity, we strangely have to go to Roman Egypt. 
In 2004, Cambridge history professor Peter Saris published a paper titled The Origins of the Manorial Economy, New Insights from Late Antiquity. Now, his specialty is Byzantine history, but for reasons that will soon be obvious, his insight is still important for Western European history. As you may have guessed, the paper is looking into the origins of manorialism in late antiquity. But first, what is manorialism? Manorialism is simply a system of agrarian land management, sometimes called bipartite, meaning that there are two parts, the domain slash villa and the tenements slash holdings. I'll just stick to the words domain and tenements. This system dominated Western European agrarian economy and was also central to serfdom. The serfs would work the lord's domain, of which the profit would go directly to the lord, and in exchange the serfs would be allowed to occupy the tenements and use the land for their own needs. Peter Saris was interested in how exactly the system began in the late Roman Empire. The problem is that manorialism wasn't first described in Western Europe until the reign of Charlemagne, hundreds of years after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The issue is that due to all the violence, civil war, and barbarian invasion, both literary and archaeological evidence for rural life in this time period became steadily more scant. The only exception to this was Roman Egypt, of which the constant domestic production of papyrus allowed for more robust record keeping. Through these records is possibly our only chance to understand the changing social relations in the countryside of the late Roman Empire. Peter Saris did the work to dig through these documents and summarize the findings. The aristocratic family he studied was the Appian family. The Appian family essentially ran an operation which is extremely similar to, if not exactly, the bipartite system of manorialism. The estates of the Appian family were essentially divided into two categories. The revenue records indicate that one type of property makes the majority of the profit, whilst the other type makes almost no net profit, yet houses many resident workers. Keep in mind that this is Roman Egypt, so the Appian family spoke Greek, and so the terms used are also in Greek. These two different types of land holdings were the Epoikia and the Autorgia. The Epoikia made almost no profit and had many resident workers, whilst the Autorgia was the main source of revenue for the Appian family. Furthermore, the resident workers of the Epoikia were charged with tax payments in cash and crop, but also charged to provide labor on the Autorgia. If you haven't caught on yet, the Epoikia is the tenements and the Autorgia is the domain. Why am I telling you this? Because this is a clear parallel to the system of manorialism found in Roman Egypt centuries before being first described in Western Europe. And where there is manorialism, there is also serfdom. Okay, so why is an Egyptian aristocratic family engaging in a system of agriculture which is traditionally associated with Northern European knights and castles? There is more papyrological evidence to show that the Appian family wasn't the only one in Roman Egypt engaging in the bipartite system. So between the 3rd and 6th centuries, the way that the elite of Egypt administered their land went through a shift. By the 3rd century, the land was primarily leased, meaning that their main source of revenue was rent payments from tenant farmers, such as the aforementioned Inquilini. Whilst by the 6th century, their main source of revenue was a different sort of contractual relationship. The inhabitants of the Epoikia were being given the right to inhabit this land and use it for their own needs, in exchange for labor which they provided on the Autorgia. Then the produce from the Autorgia were sold at the market, making up the majority of the profit for the landowner. In a nutshell, there was a shift in payment, not in rent, but in labor. This is significant because A, it shows that landowners were becoming more direct with the administration of their land, and went from pay me some money and do what you want, to do this very specific thing for me, and hence B, rural communities became more centralized around these administering landowners. We also see a shift based on the use of language in the records from the 3rd to 6th centuries. In the 3rd century, much of the countryside land was described as komet, meaning a proper village of freemen. Yet by the 6th century, the use of the word komet died off and had been replaced by the term epoikia, among others. This further indicates a consolidation of countryside Egypt into the dominance of the bipartite estates. As Epoikia clearly indicates, as we've seen before, settlements which are directly located in aristocratic estates. So what led to this point? How and why did the aristocratic elite start gobbling up and consolidating the countryside in Roman Egypt? This is where it really gets interesting. Again, it relates back to Diocletian. Back when Diocletian was introducing his reforms and expanding the bureaucracy, 
The same reforms were being placed on Egypt. Again, this included the massive tax reforms that were being described by some contemporaries as oppressive. Naturally, many overburdened peasant families sought to dodge these taxes. Ironically, they did so by approaching the new bureaucratic officials themselves that Diocletian had created. In the eastern half of the empire, and particularly Egypt, the expansion of the imperial bureaucracy was even more dramatic when Emperor Constantine moved the capital to Constantinople. He created the Byzantine Senate, with 2,000 new senatorial positions to be filled immediately. All these new bureaucratic positions were being filled by the ultra-wealthy, because these positions had an education requirement, and in ancient Rome, the only way to get educated was by personally hiring tutors. So here, you have a situation where the people filling up these bureaucratic positions are already extremely wealthy landowners. These extremely wealthy landowners are also required to collect taxes for the imperial government. Not only that, but they even calculate how much taxes should be collected in the first place. Now you also have a large amount of overburdened peasant villagers, desperate to dodge the tax. Now there's a lot of technical details on how this happens, but I'll break it down in a simple way. To understand what happens next, put yourself in the position of one of these bureaucrats. You are extremely wealthy. You now also are in charge of collecting taxes for the imperial government. Not only that, but you are also in charge of calculating how much taxes you should collect. Now here's the kicker. How much taxes should you collect from yourself? It doesn't take a genius to realize that there's nothing stopping you from quote-unquote adjusting the amount you owe the government. This essentially gave you a free pass for corruption. Give you and your friends a generous tax discounts and harshly punish your enemies with mountains of taxes, all sanctioned by the government. Now imagine you're a village peasant. The government has just started levying extremely high taxes on your family. They are the Capitatio Iugaccio, meaning it's based on how many persons and how much land is under your family. Notably, the tax calculation is not based on how much revenue you bring in. So especially as a farmer, if you have a bad harvest year, the tax won't be any more forgiving and it can ruin you. The good news is that you know your local tax collector is, a wealthy senator, or a dukes in the case of the Appian family, or some other bureaucratic position. And you know how much of a saving grace it can be to get on his good side. So what do you do? You get him to become your patron. Patronage is an entire cultural institution in Rome that's as old as Rome itself. It describes a sort of relationship between people, which is at the same time more complicated and more fluid than, say, a conventional relationship between an employer and a wage employee that we see in the modern day. Rather than employer and employee, we see a relationship between patron and client. Perhaps the most simple example of this is when a patron supports an artist or a sculptor or a philosopher or some other great talent. A quote-unquote patron of the arts, if you will. Now obviously, there is nothing inherently valuable about making art. You can't feed a family with art. So if you were an artist, you had to find a wealthy patron to support you. You would make him art, and in turn he would support you, not only financially, but in other ways as well, such as giving you food, housing, helping you further in your career, with better connections, etc. Another common example was a private security guard could also be patronized. That's the most simple form of patronage, just between two individuals. There is, however, another type of patronage, and this patronage is of entire communities. This form of civic patronage was very popular in the late Republic, and it was vital in the devolving political situation of the first century BC. An individual could find himself patronizing an entire community essentially by doing favors, such as granting certain legal privileges, such as granting citizenship, or funding public work projects, such as the construction of an aqueduct or a library for a city. Naturally, you have to be very powerful to be a civic patron. In the first century BC, Julius Caesar and Pompey essentially fought their civil war by clashing together the communities that they had patronized. Conducting favors was enough to garner military support and the levering of troops, a problem which quickly worried Caesar as he knew that Pompey had so many client communities. Essentially, civic patronage was a vital political tool in the late Republic. Into the Roman Empire, this continued. Augustus Caesar, the first Roman emperor, described himself as a patron to all of Rome, effectively making all of Rome his client. A general conquering a foreign territory might patronize the territory, making it a client state. 
there really was no limit for how this relationship could be used, and although it would be idealistic to assume that civic clients never backstabbed their patrons, patronage did play a role because it continued to be central, as many Roman cities would continue to have their patrons, and their beauties would be built by patrons. Heck, patronage even exists today if you think about it. I live in New York, and Carnegie Hall, a music hall in Manhattan, was a public works project funded by the business tycoon, Andrew Carnegie. But I digress. The point is, patronage was important for Rome. So going back to those tax burdened peasants, they had every interest in mind to seek patronage from their local tax collectors. How did this look like? The peasants would receive tax protection from the wealthy aristocrat tax collectors, and in turn, as clients, they would now be expected to provide their service to the tax collector. Going back to Roman Egypt, we can now see a pattern. So these peasants are offering their labor as service, they are farmers, so they work the fields naturally. So the service that they offer the patron is to work the land in the autorgia, the domain. Okay, we're almost there. Now remember, there's no need to patronize one peasant at a time. We can patronize entire communities. So entire villages of peasants decided to become clients to tax collect their patrons to dodge the tax. This is the apoikia. This is the tenement. Now, there's only one thing left to tie up. If these villages were originally just clients to their patrons, how did the patrons end up directly owning the land of the villages? This was essentially just a tax loophole. The tax collectors would write off these villages as their own property, so that the villages weren't liable for the tax. The problem is that once ownership is expressed in writing, it's almost impossible to get it back. So via this elaborate tax fraud scheme, Roman aristocrats were able to take control of massive tracts of land in Egypt. What happened next is unclear. We do know that Constantine reformed the Capitatio Iugatio to not let Coloni leave the land that they worked on, possibly as an attempt by central authority to make sense of all this fraudulent land grabs. But that is a conjecture. So to wrap everything up, in summary, we can say this happened. <laughs> During the crisis of the 3rd century, the Roman Empire was embroiled in constant civil wars, plagues, famines, and general chaos. At the end of the turmoil, a single victor rose, Emperor Diocletian, and to ensure that the political chaos was alleviated, he conducted numerous political reforms aimed at replenishing the imperial treasury through massive expansion of the bureaucracy. These new taxes, however, were considered way too severe and many free farmers and peasants sought ways to dodge the tax. Coincidentally, all these new bureaucratic positions for tax collection were held by wealthy landowners who, without any supervision, got corrupt and gamed the system. Through a series of tax loopholes, a series of land grabs were conducted to alleviate the tax burden of peasants and simultaneously benefit the corrupt aristocrats in a sort of patronage system. Because these tax loopholes were now in writing, peasants subsequently lost their land, not just in legality, but also in reality, subsequently turning their entire villages into client states for aristocrats. Finally, Emperor Constantine's passing of the law not allowing Coloni to leave their land made sure that these peasants were never even allowed to leave these villages. So then, by the end of the 4th century, the Coloni were clients legally bound to the land of their patrons, and serving their patrons in the form of labor. This entire cause-effect domino chain was not at first noticed by scholars specifically studying Western Europe because again, unlike Roman Egypt, the evidence to show any of this occurring was sparse. As unlike East, the eastern half, the western half of the empire collapsed as violently as it did. There are however clues to indicate that this indeed happened in the west as well. For one, the laws regarding the colony instituted by Emperor Constantine and subsequently codified by the Codex Theodosinus were empire-wide reforms, not just laws pertaining to, say, Egypt itself. This indicates that the problem of mass corruption and peasant flight was big enough that it constituted reform at the imperial level. Secondly, we do have archaeological evidence. There was in fact a record number of villa construction throughout the Western Roman Empire in the 4th century. This indicates that there was a tremendous growth in the power and number of the landed aristocracy throughout the West. Surely these villas were being occupied by the newly appointed Dioglacianic uh, bureaucrats which had the same capabilities for corruption as the new ones in Egypt did. 
overall, even though the direct evidence is technically lacking, it's also very hard to make a compelling argument against the claim that the same thing didn't occur in the West beyond, we just don't know. That being said, there is some nuance to keep in mind. For one, even though the rise of the colony is stark and the mass consolidation of the countryside into just a few aristocratic families is groundbreaking, it's important to note that the other two forms of labor, uh, Servi and Inquilini, didn't just die off. The Appian family themselves still had some renters and even slaves working on their estates. On the local level, the terms in which someone gives up their labor can be highly individual. It's best to think of this period not as a complete switch from slavery to serfdom, but rather as the birth of serfdom as just another arsenal of forced labor for the elite. Another complicating matter is that especially in Western Europe, slavery actually had a renaissance of sort after the fall of the Roman Empire. Overall, as Western Europe devolved into violent chaos in the 5th century, Slavery was not replaced with serfdom, but rather slavery itself was reinvigorated as warlords would capture and enslave countless communities, just as the Romans had done to their Mediterranean neighbors centuries ago. Into the 9th century, Europe would still be ravaged by pagan Vikings and Magyars who would enslave countless Europeans. Many of those slaves would be sold to the Byzantines, so the Eastern Roman Empire itself also had a slavery reinvigoration as well. Because of the chaos that followed the collapse of the Roman Empire, it would also be a mistake to believe that, say, a 12th century French serf was the direct descendant of a 4th century colonus. The fact is that the early medieval period was highly volatile, and social hierarchy could change and flip at a rapid pace. Medieval society didn't start to solidify until the 11th century, well after the reign of Constantine. What we can see, however, is that Roman society did go through profound changes in the 4th century. This is hands down one of the most interesting topics that I have ever researched, and in the end what I learned is just how revolutionary the Roman Empire was. Here we have an institution, the institution of serfdom, a highly unique form of forced labor which immediately makes you think of medieval Europe. Yet the origin of this institution, meaning the very idea of such a thing, essentially came from a gigantic empire trying to maintain economic control over its disparate parts, and ultimately failing. What a perfect way to set us up for the medieval era. This is likewise a story of what happens when bureaucracy expands at a rapid pace with no oversight or forethought. This entire situation actually reminds me of a specific moment in American history, but that's a story for another time. Lastly, I learned how rewarding it can be to think about how things really work on the very deepest cause-effect level. I encourage you, the viewer, to have the courage to critically think about the institutions in your own life in this very way. Believe me, there's not enough people in the world that do that. Anyway, that's all I got. Be sure to like, subscribe, or comment if you hated this. Well, see you later.